good afternoon, uh, good evening, uh, uh, depending on where you are uh, at this time of the day. Uh, welcome uh, to this ESO webinar on technical tips and tricks for complete cytoreactive surgery. Uh, uh, we are uh, very proud to welcome you to this uh, webinar, which is the, the first one of a video-based uh, series uh, that uh, that the Education and Training Committee of ESO has put together uh, uh, for you uh, who are interested in peritoneal surface malignancies. Today's uh, uh, video uh, series will be on specifically pelvic peritonectomy, uh, which is a very common procedure uh, in cytoreactive surgery. And, uh, and I'm uh, very glad uh, here to, to introduce you, uh, our presenters and, uh, and moderators and commentators. Uh, uh, I didn't introduce myself. My name is Santiago Gonzalez Moreno. I am uh, the head of surgical oncology, uh, co-director of peritoneal surface malignancies uh, and medical director here at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Madrid, Spain. Uh, I am a co-director of the European School of Peritoneal Surface Oncology and former ESO president. Um, and I'm very proud to present to you Dr. Lana Vichalik, uh, uh, who is there with us. Uh, she's a surgical oncologist. Uh, she's the head of peritoneal surface malignancies at uh, Hospital uh, Moises Brogi in Barcelona, Spain, one of the leading uh, uh, centers in peritoneal malignancies in, uh, in the Spanish state. Uh, and uh, also a member of the uh, European Society, uh, sorry, European uh, School of Peritoneal Surface Oncology Board, and also in the ESO European uh, uh, Education and Training Committee. And she has been actually the mastermind behind all this series. So we're very grateful for her for this. And I'm very, very glad Hello, now to, to reach out uh, to the other side of the ocean. Uh, and introduce you to the, our uh, two commentators and moderators uh, of this webinar as well. Uh, on one side, we have Dr. Vadim Bushin, surgical oncologist, also uh, director of peritoneal surface malignancies unit and director also of the research program at the Institute for Cancer at Mercy Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. And also with an interest in education in the health professions, uh, as he is a fellow of, of its master's at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, last but not least at all, uh, our uh, uh, friend and medical, uh, sorry, gynecological oncologist, Tan Dellinger. Uh, we're very grateful that we have also uh, a representation from the JYN oncology community uh, in this in these webinars. Uh, she is again a JYN oncologist at City of Hope, Cancer Center at Los Angeles, California, uh, USA. And she is the leader of uh, the PIPAC trial there in ovarian cancer and with an interest in research in the molecular mechanisms of uh, HIPEC in ovarian cancer. So without further delay, uh, because we have an hour for this and uh, I think a very interesting things ahead of us, uh, I would like to to tell you how we're going to do this. Uh, Dr. Bijalik will start by giving us a short presentation on pelvic peritonectomy. Uh, after that, we will have uh, both videos. Video number one uh, is a pelvic peritonectomy uh, with uh, rectal resection. Second one is same thing without rectal resection. So uh, so-called uh, 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 visceral sparing pelvic peritonectomy. After both videos, we will have discussions uh, uh, that will be uh, led by us or comment or comments, and you all are invited. And we please ask you to uh, write your comments uh, and questions in the chat, because we'll make our best uh, to uh, to answer your questions and comments. So, without further delay, please, Lana, uh, you can you may go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, Santi, for the introduction of this webinar, and thank you for the opportunity to have it. Thank you to the ESO specifically, who always is a great help in organizing these. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, to the presentation, which is really just a brief theoretical introduction to the topic. I hope you can all see my screen. Is that right? Not yet, Lana. No, not yet. Okay, sorry, let's try again.
Now we can. Now we can. All right. Excellent. Great. So um, we all know that uh, side reductive surgery can be sort of summarized or defined as a um, surgery that really uh, contains uh, peritonectomy procedures or removal of peritoneum together with visceral resections. And the aim of this surgery is to obviously completely remove the visible disease. Pelvic perit peritonectomy, as, as you have mentioned, uh, which can be done either with or without rectosigmoid resection, um, is really very frequently done as part of side reductive surgery. So we thought that this first series, uh, first part of the series on, on technical aspects of side reductive surgery, focused on pelvic, pelvic peritonectomy made sense. Now, why is it so frequent? Uh, I think this is also quite well known and, and pretty easy to understand. Is because peritoneal metastases generally are considered not to be random within the peritoneal space, but governed by certain rules. Um, one of them is gravity, uh, and other one, probably the two most important ones, uh, is the peritoneal fluid flow and the site of absorption. This is a, a, a schematic from a nice article that was done actually on ovarian cancer that looked at um, sort of the patterns of acidic flow and the sites of most absorption uh, and through that try to explain why um, involvement along the ascending colon, the right diaphragm and in the pelvis or in the recess next to the rect rectosigmoid colon was so frequent in ovarian cancer specifically. There are other things that probably play a role such as peristalsis as well as the positioning of certain recesses and ligaments and also has to do with peritoneal liquid flow and where it tends to form some stasis and where the, the cells have more time to implant. This is especially true, these sort of rules about where the disease is going to be most heavily uh, present. Um, it seems to be most uh, clear cut in, in diseases with less biological aggressiveness, such, such as pseudomyxoma peritoneae, uh, for example, and a little bit different in very aggressive disease that, such as gastric cancer, for example. But by and large, these are some useful things to keep in mind in terms of why we find peritoneal metastasis more often in certain places than others. So uh, pelvis, both for gravity and for acidic flow issues, is a very frequent site of involvement. So when do we do it? And today, in today's videos, we will really be talking about a complete pelvic peritonectomy where we remove all of the peritoneum from the pelvis. Uh, in one video, we will see it done on block with the hysterectomy and the rectosigmoid resection. I would say that's probably sort of the classic image we have in our mind of what the pelvic peritonectomy is. We will not be t talking about uh, cases which are also sometimes seen where the disease can be quite limited and uh, really just an excision of a portion of the peritoneum with the deposit will be sufficient. We will be talking about doing the entire pelvic peritoneum. So we do that when we have multiple peritoneal uh, deposits and it's more convenient uh, and uh, more complete to remove all of the peritoneum or in cases where we have really very uh, finely distributed, almost confluent disease. Sometimes, even when we have fewer masses, but that are larger and, and evolve several of the pelvic organs together, bound, bound, them, bound them together, it's also very useful to actually do a complete pelvic peritonectomy in order to, to uh, resect the disease and block, which was quicker, safer, and more complete than trying to separate things that are bound together by either directly by tumor or by some inflammation caused by the tumor. And finally, and this perhaps is a bit more controversial and we won't really be going into detail in, in terms of these kind of decisions, but there are some situations where at least some groups advocate sort of a um, uh, complete uh, parietal peritonectomy, regardless of the uh, amount of involvement, for example, in peritoneal mesothelioma or in, um, in some cases, even ovarian cancer. So if you're thinking about doing that kind of uh, side reductive surgery, you would also need to do a complete, uh, complete pelvic peritonectomy. Uh, so this is an image uh, from Dr. Sugarbaker, which uh, really tries to describe uh, what we will see in the first video, which I hear called the classic pelvic peritonectomy, meaning that 
uh, not only all of the peritoneum in the mm, pelvis is removed, but also uterus, both ovaries, and the rectosigmoid colon. Um, so as you can see in this schematic, um, and we will see this in the video, we will sort of uh, start mentally to make our, our map of where the peritoneum needs to be removed from the tip of the bladder. We will peel it down the bladder, moving to the side, uh, cutting the round ligaments, uh, mobilizing the ascending colon and the decelling colon on the left, lifting them uh, up and medializing them until we see the gonadal vessels and the ureters. The gonadal vessels will be divided. The ureters will be followed all the way to their insertion to the bladder. We will then control the, the uh, base of the inflow to the rectosigmoid colon, which is not seen in the video, but it obviously has to be done. Mobilize the rectum in the mesorectal plane until we reach all the way down to the bottom of the pelvis, to the cul-de-sac, and then transect the vagina and the, and the rectum. Um, this can be done uh, by preserving the rectoid sigmoid colon as well. So in cases where the disease is not so heavy over the serosa, even if it is present all the way up the sides on the peritoneum, we can frequently spare the rectal sigmoid and do a visceral sparing or rectal sparing pelvic peritonectomy where everything else is done exactly the same, including the complete removal of the peritoneum from the cul-de-sac, but we will cut the peritoneum alongside along the sides of the rectal sigmoid and then lift the cul-de-sac from the anterior surface of the rectum. So we will see an example of that in the video as well. Um, of course, there are other things in the pelvis as well in terms of viscera. So I would say that in peritoneal surface malignancies, the most frequent scenario as far as organ preserving um, is that the bladder is essentially always preserved. It would be very unusual for us in peritoneal surface malignancy to do uh, a bladder resection, although uh, the tip of the bladder the, uh, can sometimes be involved and needs a small um, sleeve resection, but a complete cystectomy is, is very unusual. Um, ovaries are a little bit of a different story, um, and this is also perhaps a, a, a topic that we will not go into detail in terms of when they can be preserved, but there are some situations where we can think about doing that, um, and we need to modify this resection in order to do so. And as far as uh, the rectum, I would say think about preserving it uh, because it can be done more often than we think. Uh, or, or uh, if we uh, learn how to do a visceral sparing peritonectomy and we think about it, um, sometimes we, we are surprised as to how frequently the rectum can be preserved. Um, just a, a, a small point uh, on the fact that we will really be focusing on staying in this subperitoneal plane. These uh, pictures uh, on the right of the screen are borrowed from, a, from actually a paper from Dr. Gushin, who is here to, with us today and will comment some things about, um, about the technique and, and uh, decisions during pelvic peritonectomy. Um, here, I just wanted to point out the fact that uh, we really need to follow the peritoneum during the, this dissection rather than thinking about the organs. And we need to be aware of the differences between the, the, the positioning of the peritoneal reflection anteriorly versus posteriorly. So anteriorly tends to be quite a bit more superficial than the, than the true cul-de-sac. And we will be demonstrating in the video how we try to reach all the way beyond the edge of the cul-de-sac, regardless of how deep uh, it is positioned. So if we try to sort of list this procedure as a step-by-step, -step, and it's not always exactly in this perfect order, um, but I would mentally uh, summarize it as something like this. So we will start at the tip of the bladder and then move down as well down the sides of the bladder. We will then um, move to the sides of the colon, uh, incise the peritoneum at a variable distance from the colon, depending on, on how much involvement there is. We will then, through this incision of the peritoneum, lift and medialize the colon, both the ascending one on the right side and the descending one on the left side. Of course, in this uh, lateral dissection, we will also transect the round ligament in women where we are doing a um, hysterectomy. This allows quite a bit of mobility of the peritoneum medially. 
Laterally, once the colon is mobilized, we'll be able to identify gonadal vessels and ureters. We will um, ligate the gonadal vessels and we ligate them quite high, which also helps with mobilization of the peritoneum. Um, if we're doing a, um, um, uh, sorry, we will then uh, sort of define the upper limit of the pelvic peritonectomy, which if we're doing a complete one, and we will see this in the, in the video, uh, is really at the insertion of the uh, small bowel or the peritoneal reflection at the base of the small bowel and the duodenum. Once you size that peritoneum, you see duodenum. That should be our superior dissection. And if we move to, from right to left along that line, that's going to lead us straight over the vena cava to where the inferior mesenteric artery is. If we're doing a rectosigmoid resection, we will then ligate the inflow to the rectosigmoid colon and we'll have our, our rectum uh, uh, mobilized. Um, anteriorly, we will then return and make sure that the peritoneum is dissected all the way down to the base of the bladder where we can identify the level of the cervix. We will ligate the uterine vessels of both sides and then transect the vagina. And we do it in this video by transecting the anterior wall first and then the posterior wall and then reflecting that posterior uh, wall anteriorly in order to again follow the peritoneum until we are beyond the cul-de-sac. And then we are actually going to define uh, the rectum, uh, which at this point will lift up and we will able to do the transection and the anastomosis of the rectum quite a bit higher than where it would be if we transected it exactly at the level of uh, the vaginal transection. Um, so that would be sort of our map for the procedure and what we will see in the video. And this allows us to have something like this as a specimen at the end. So we see here that the peritoneum were removed from the bladder. We see the uterus that it's at attached, the adnexa on both sides. In this case, there's a large mass on one side. And then this is the peritoneum um, posteriorly of the cul-de-sac, which is also completely removed intact. And in this case, we did not include the rectum. This is a visceral sparing peritonectomy and it, it does have the appendix attached or a little bit of cecum and appendix, but of course this is not mandatory to include in the same specimen, but it happens to be included in this, in this example. Uh, and as far as what the pelvis looks like after this is co completed, we should be able to really see all the structures in the pelvis very well because we removed all of the peritoneum. Usually if there's some fat below it, it will also go with the peritoneum and we will be able to see the iliac vessels, uh, the ureters here, um, this is the left iliac uh, common uh, vein. Um, the bladder is retracted uh, anteriorly. This is the uh, closure of the vagina, and this is the rectum without any peritoneum in the cul-de-sac. And this is just a, a, a quick comment about something I was mentioning before. So um, this is very useful in sort of classic peritoneal surface malignancy surgery uh, or essential procedure, but it can be a useful plane of the section to learn even when we're dealing with something that you could call a locally advanced uh, pelvic tumor. So this is an example really of a primary colon tumor that is very locally advanced. It is involving a portion of the omentum. You, you really, you can sort of see where the uh, rectosigmoid is. You cannot really see very well where the uterus and ovary is, is. So our plan for something like this is to basically get out of the peritoneum and work entirely extraperitoneally as a pelvic peritonectomy, which will allow us here, you can sort of see anteriorly that we already started that plane. And if we uh, move laterally, we'll be able to find a very nice clean plane with, uh, with that, without really any danger of getting into uh, pelvic sidewall structures, which we otherwise really cannot see and uh, perform a complete resection. So uh, it's useful to learn this technique, even if we're doing something that is not uh, carcinomatosis. Uh, before we start with the video, I just wanted to thank my entire team uh, here from Barcelona. We are four surgeons that are here pictured. And I wanted to especially thank our, our research fellow, Juliana Now, who really did a, a wonderful job editing these videos, which is not easy at all. So thank you to Julian, and I hope that you will enjoy them. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Lana. 
it was a great overview, a good uh, roadmap for what uh, we're going to see. Uh, I think the is is great uh, uh, for teaching uh, this step by step, uh, you know, uh, uh, methodology uh, in in really uh, knowing what we will have uh, uh, in mind, and and this is exactly what you will now see uh in in a couple of, of of seconds in the video that we will uh show so again uh no no more delay uh, uh lana will will now present uh, the first video which is uh a so-called classical pelvic peritonectomy uh, which is the one that uh, uh involves or, or resects uh, the rectus sigmoid column along with uh with uh, the uh, uterus, ovaries, and peritoneum. So go ahead, Lana. Um, okay, can you see the screen? Can you see the video? Yes, we can see it, yeah. All right, just for the our participants, as we did a little uh, trial, we were aware, we, we became aware that through Zoom, the video uh, seems to be a little bit choppy. So I apologize for that, but hopefully you can still see it well, and we will try to fix this technical issue. Um, technical issue for the next one. So uh, as you could see, we just made an incision. And as we are approaching the lower part of opening the uh, aponeurosis, the fascia, we open the fascia, but we try not to cut through the peritoneum right away. We try to create this peritoneal flap at the very bottom of the decision, really from the get-go, because it's much easier to do it that way, to get started right away. So you could see that the peritoneum is separated from the abdominal wall, uh, just enough to be able to place our retractor. So retraction is really key for, for peritoneal surface malignancy. People use different retractors. Um, I am a big fan of the Thompson retractor, which is the one that you see here. It really provides excellent, excellent um, uh, retraction, which can be adjusted any way you want. So here, what we're trying to show you basically is the extent of the disease. As you could see, we have started this pe pelvic peritonectomy already. As I said, we did this really uh, right at the beginning by um, separating the, the very uh, low part of the uh, incision from the peritoneum laterally and anteriorly from the bladder. And you can see here marked in these circles that the disease is not massive, but it's quite diffuse. It involves uh, multiple places in the, on the peritoneum, um, both anterior to the uterus, and I will try to show you here posterior to the uterus as well. Laterally here, the colon is a little bit uh, caught into the lateral peritoneum because she had, if I'm not mistaken, this lady, a prior ophorectomy. And then uh, we will try to show you the disease in the cul-de-sac, which is a little bit harder to see, but this uh, serosa of the rectum was uh, infiltrated and uh, we did not think that we could get um, uh, a complete resection down without a rectum resection in this case. Um, so this is the extent of the disease. And as you can see, we will now try to find the edge of the bladder at its tip. So tractioning on that little bit of peritoneum that we have at the bottom, we are looking for the tip of the, uh, the bladder. We then grasp it, the uracus essentially, with a clamp. We retract the bladder upwards and we uh, look for that fine plane uh, looking really all the time at the peritoneum. So you saw that we dissected the tip of the bladder. We then start to move along the side of the bladder. And this is now a view of the right side. Uh, we actually have already incised the peritoneum along the colon. You can see that the colon is already medialized and moved to the left side of the screen. And our goal here is to view where the gonadal vessels and the ureter are. So we see the the uh, ureter, we then dissect, uh, transect the gonadal vessels, and we then continue to retract the colon and the peritoneum to the left and dissecting it from the ureter, which will uh, follow all the way to its insertion into the, the bladder. Um, now we're looking at the superior edge of our pelvic peritonectomy um, uh, dissection. So we, what we did here is we retracted the cecum, cecum upwards and we are uh, cutting the peritoneum away from the edge, the border of the cecum. And we will be moving from right uh, to the middle or to the left alongside the 
peritoneal reflection that is at the bottom of the small bowel. You saw their duodenum for a little bit. And then we move to the left side where we really do exactly the same. You saw this sort of um, uh, movement of the colon from left to right now. We have uh, done the exact same thing that we did on the right side. You can see here again, the gonadal vessel has been tied already and we followed the ureter until its insertion. One, once this is done, we will move back to the bottom of the, um, uh, the field, so to speak. We have taken the peritoneum down the bladder, basically down to the end, and you will see that we will be looking to define the cervix, make sure that we're creating that bladder flap low enough that we can be below the cervix and uh, enter into the vagina. Um, the, the transection of the uh, umbilical ligament is really helpful to get the specimen to move more medially, and we like it here, but it can be done with just cautery or, or a clip. And then once we are, uh, have this nice mobilization of the uh, ureter all the way down, we need to uh, identify and ligate the ut uterine vessels. Um, we do it here with a stitch in order to give us some retraction and also to be able to really get that peritoneum all the way to the uh, level of the ureter, staying really very close, but making sure that we are not hurting the ureter, obviously. So here on the right side, we do the same thing. We ligate the uterine vessels. And once they're ligated, we will start by uh, incising the uh, vaginal wall. You can see here that we are incising the anterior wall. And then we grasp the cervix and sort of flip it a little bit upwards and, and uh, backwards so that we can see the back wall of the vagina. And um, we want to do that in order, so we are transecting the uterine vessels here. That gives us better access. And here we're transecting the uh, the, the posterior wall of the vagina. And once we do that, we are sort of uh, not immediately going straight back towards the rectum, but we're going down further, uh, lifting the posterior wall of the vagina up and then dissecting along the posterior wall of the vagina until we get to below the uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, once we're happy with that, we are obviously always moving circumferentially in this dissection. Here we're moving circumferentially around the rectum and the plane of dissection is the same as the mesorectal um, uh, plane that we would do for a, for a rectal cancer case. Uh, the difference being that once we're here, as you can see here, the, the posterior wall of the vagina is lifted up and we have uh, come now below the cul-de-sac uh, which is lifted upwards here in our hand, and we start to transect this fatty tissue until we come to the level of the serosa. And we will then start uh, incising the mesorectum, uh, lifting the rectum and, and making it more straight until we're able to uh, lift the cul-de-sac maximally up and preserving as much rectal length as we can. Once we are done with that, we are happy where we are. We transected the rectum with uh, the contour staple, as you can see, and we have our specimen out, which is quite similar to the one on the photo. You see that the peritoneum of the whole pelvis is intact. Uh, uterus and nexa are there. The rectosigma is attached, um, and the cul-de-sac with the infiltrating disease is right here in the middle of the screen. And so just a couple of words about reconstruction. You see us here closing the vagina. We do that with micro stitches, nothing really very uh, special there. And then as far as the colorectal anastomosis, I will like to do a couple of comments there. Here's just a view of what the pelvis looks like once all of the, uh, the resection is done. You can see here the psoas muscle on both sides. You can see the uh, iliac arteries. You can see both ureters going down here. You can see that we maintain the mes mesorectal plane in our dissection, which seems to be quite smooth. These are actually the hypogastric nerves, which in this lady can be seen quite well. And you can see here the vagina, the rectum seems to be really low, very retracted, but we, when we actually hold it with some, some clamps and lift it up, we have quite a bit of rectal length. You can see here the hypo, um, hypogastric nerves. 
So usually in, in, in peritoneal surface malignancies, once we do this resection and mobilization of the rectum, the anastomosis will be in about the mid-rectum, and it's rare to have it ultra low. This is a, a small trick we like to use, um, and that is to pull the ears, the, the tips of the staple line of the rectum towards the anvil and tie a loose stitch there, not stitch a tie really, um, to sort of keep them pulled in so that the anastomosis uh, is done outside of the previous staple line and we don't have staple line crossing. We saw You saw that we mobilized the, the colon, descending colon a lot, so it reaches down very, very easily. There's no tension, and we will then do a end-to-end -end EA anastomosis in the, in the usual fashion. Again, it seems to disappear, but with a little bit of traction, you actually can get it back up. And we like to generally reinforce it with some seromuscular stitches that go over the staple line all the way around, starting from the back. Um, and you will see here in a second how that looks like once it's done. And our routine is not to do a diversion. Uh, that's obviously a controversial topic that I would like uh, some the moderators to comment on as well. Um, and that would be it for the first uh, video. Santi, I think you are uh, muted. Santi, we can't hear you. Right, I was muted. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vadim. Well, thank you very much, Lana, for, for the video. I think it was a, a very good example, a demonstration of, of your prior uh, uh, presentation. Uh, While well, we see we have some uh, uh, questions here that are coming, by the way, I have to tell you that we have here people from all over the world, Ecuador, Palestine, Jordan, Switzerland, India, Turkey, Greece, Ukraine, Mexico, uh, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, uh, everybody welcome here. Uh, uh, first of all, I, I would like to, why don't we start, Vadim and, and Tan, uh, you want to uh, make some comments first or give some remarks? Uh, then. By, by the way, I, ha I have to tell you, uh, all, all, all of you, both Alana presenting and, and us moderating and discussing that uh, if we need to stay on time for this, we have about uh, 10 minutes, uh, maybe no more uh, for this. So let's let's try see how we can do this. Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, Lana, this was a, such a beautiful video, really well done. The peritonectomy was um, very interesting. And um, from a GYN oncology standpoint, I think that it really um, reflected what we do because we have a lot of those peritoneal malignancies uh, in ovarian cancer. Um, I think that uh, the from a hysterectomy standpoint, the two points I have to make are um, sometimes you have parametrial disease, or other kinds of nearby disease that uh, you would have to do a more radical hysterectomy and have to take the uterine vessels a little lateral and dissect uh, the uterine vessels out further to the hypogastric um, artery. Uh, so that would be my only, um, probably the, the point to make as a G1 oncologist. Um, the other thing is that sometimes you see a lot of retroperitoneal fibrosis, um, especially laterally next to the external iliacs uh, where the nodal disease can be. Um, which we find in ovarian cancer. So um, it makes sense as you have to start more centrally where the, where the bladder is to avoid some of the retroperitoneal disease. So, but really beautiful work. It it's, it's, uh, was really very well shot. Great, Vadim, any comments? Um, yeah, I actually, um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I enjoyed it mostly because it's, uh, um, it shows the essence of peritoneal surface malignancy surgery. So uh, surgical oncologists uh, G, uh, grew around nodal uh, surgery, uh, vascular surgery, right, right, about vascular pedicles, uh, nodal disease. Um, we have to switch our thinking a little bit when we operate on peritoneal surface malignancies. And, um, and surgery evolved, uh, surgical anatomy evolved around uh, uh, terms like uh, IP ligament, which is not a, actually a ligament, right? So it, mm -hmm. it, 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 uh, it uh, um, disappears when you talk about sur uh, um, surface malignancy surgery, about uh, peritonectomy. So you strip peritoneum and you see actually the, the, the underlying anatomy, right? 
So, and I, I think Lana's um, video shows it very well. So very broad stro strokes, uh, uh, you follow the peritoneum, not the organ. It's not about organs, it, it's about peritoneum. If organs need to go, uh, so be it, but it's, we, you, you actually follow the disease and the peritoneum. So those are my two cents. And uh, um, as a, um, I also would um, ask uh, everybody, instead of being ent entertained with this, uh, um, uh, videos uh, try to think what actually by the end of today's webinar one thing that you actually learned today and you can bring it to to the patients uh, with you so that's my plea thank you well very, very good point Vadim uh, I think that's uh, useful for all our audience uh, we have some some uh, some questions here from the audience Lana that uh, you might want to, I've been answering some some questions in the chat that you can see uh, because they were like kind of more general. But uh, first of all, I think it's very interesting for all of us. Uh, and again, we need a quick answer to all of this. What was the, the disease of this patient? Um, so we, we actually uh, have filmed a couple of patients for this video. One, one of them was gastric cancer with previous chemotherapy and new adjuvant chemotherapy. And one of them was colon cancer. Um, with prior surgery, but not uh, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy immediately before. I think the point that uh, Tan made about changes in, in fibrosis is a very good one. Uh, there's definitely cases where the, the plane is more difficult to see, but I find that uh, staying in this subperitoneal uh, plane almost always will allow you to, to, uh, to find the right plane, especially if you see one area where there was a lot of disease, there's a lot of response and a lot of fibrosis. Don't start there. Don't, don't get stuck into that. Move away and find a better subperitoneal plane and then follow it to your problem area. It's going to help you essentially always. I also agree that sometimes you need to take the vessels further out because it will be easier, a cleaner plane. Absolutely. As far as um, lymph node involvement along the iliacs, uh, I have a case right now in the OR that, it, that was exactly like that. Um, so we tend to, and it's not always possible, but I would say mostly it is possible. Uh, we tend to not mix the two up because sometimes it will complicate your pelvic dissection. Do the peritonectomy, get the mass out, get the peritoneum out, and then do the lymphadenectomy. I think it's easier that way. Uh, okay. And then just very briefly, last comment, also going a little bit beyond what we just saw. So, for example, in case of a man, sometimes you, your, your cul-de-sac disease is going to basically penetrate a little bit further out from the cul-de-sac, get into the seminal vesicles. It doesn't matter. Uh, it uh, This approach will lead you right down to them and you have to resect them. You resect them. And once you pass that, you will you will be able to do that lift of the cul-de-sac, just like we saw in this video. So just a couple of quick pointers of things that we didn't see in the video, but that are important. OK, I, th I think there are very, very good points when you get to uh, to to that uh, in in men and sometimes when you find that first is uh, you you see what what do I have to do now but but I, I think you explained to it very very beautifully uh, quick questions uh, 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 Doctor Alievi wanted to know if you could clarify how you reflect the dog ears on your rectal stump. Um... Very quickly, we literally put a, a simple silk stu such, stitch through one ear, out the other, and then tie it loosely, not very tight, along the anvil. Once you put the stapler, you put the anvil out, and you just tie it around it, and this is will this will basically bring them in like this, and your staple line will lie outside of the staple line. Okay. We have uh, a paper on this in Analytic Surgical Oncology, which actually has some nice pictures. It's easy to understand. Great. Uh, Again, I don't want to leave questions out, uh, but we have also the other video to show, and, and I think we have interest of time. But uh, again, quickly, uh, I think there are uh, you know differences in, in practice uh, regarding the uh, whether stenting the ureters uh, before surgery. Uh, I guess Lana, you don't do it. Uh, uh, no, maybe I'll let the other moderators comment. How about but then ten. Any indications for that? Time. <laughs> Saves time. <laughs> what about you, Tan? 
uh, I, I usually don't, but sometimes when I know there's a lot of retroperitoneal fibrosis, it helps. Okay, so, so that, I guess there are some indications for that maybe. Uh, and then, uh, Vadim, maybe you can comment on, on, on this question about uh, indications for diverting ostomy in, in this kind of operation. What do you think? Uh, well, um, uh, there is... Um, and again, we try to need to be as concise as we can. Right. Um, um, uh, the uh, quick answer is no indications. Um, and um, uh, the long answer, well, it depends if a patient had rectal cancer or radiation uh, to the rectum, or it's a very low uh, dissection or previous LAR uh, uh, in the patient. So um, our rate of preventive ostomies is about 5% <clears throat> and another 5% uh, terminal uh, kind of uh, planned uh, colostomy or ileostomy when you can't reconnect. So uh, that uh, is uh, being discussed in our paper like two years ago, I think, in Annals of Surgical Oncology. Okay, Some uh, also some other question that is very common uh, in, in the audience uh, when we're starting with this, uh, yeah, how long do we keep the Foley catheter uh, for these patients after uh, complete bladder stripping? Uh, Tan, for example, do you can you comment on this? Yeah, I, I think that it is a good idea to keep the Foley for a while longer. We usually keep it for about or, three plus days and try yeah. to do avoiding trial. I think that's right. Okay, Vadim, any, any um, magic uh, uh, day number there? No, no magic day number. No, I tend to okay. uh, remove fully early. Okay. Uh, other question about uh, uh, whether it, it is helpful or not to uh, um, to to fill the bladder up with saline, for example, uh, when you're doing the peripatronectomy and bladder stripping. Uh, any comments on this? Uh, for example, for me, uh, for me no. I, I would say no. Uh, it's for me, it's not helpful at all because it occupies space. Mm -hmm. in the pelvis yeah. and you don't always have a lot especially if there's a mass i think you can retract it better uh if it's empty um uh, we we saw in the video retraction by the tip with a clamp but at some point we sometimes switch to actually uh holding it by the by the ball by, by the uh a balloon of the foley catheter so if you let the foley catheter loose you grab the ball and bring it up to the tip you will actually extend kind of stretch up the bladder even more and it will be really helpful for the dissection okay um and again uh, uh, there are questions that i think that uh, everybody who's uh, you know starting their uh, experience in this in this field uh, always has which is about extent of peritonectomy uh, specifically uh, in the pelvic peritoneum uh, whether it is worthy or not worthy to preserve some bladder peritoneum in case you don't find uh, disease between the bladder and the uterus, uh, do you think that makes sense or not? Uh, you know, in my own experience, sometimes you, you you lose more time trying to make that decision than doing it. But uh, but what what do you we're, think? We're struggling with a uh, half peritoneum, then stripping it all. Yeah, I sometimes I've done it, and I I would say I would I, I almost always regretted it because it's way faster to just take it all off. <laughs> Great. I think we have, you know, most of the questions that we have had are kind of like going in the same direction. Uh, uh, there's some more that maybe we can discuss. We we have about uh, 15 minutes left uh, from the webinar, and I think that the flow of, of the agenda has been quite uh, quite good in terms of, uh, of moving from theory to practice and seeing it. We'd like you all to see uh, this uh, next example of a, of a uh, rectosigmoid pre uh, preserving or, or so-called uh, visceral sparing pelvic peritonectomy. And I think that maybe Lana, uh, in this presentation, maybe we can, uh, we don't need maybe to to uh, to stop as much. Maybe we can, you can just maybe stop at, at, at uh, where you think there's uh, any specific thing that has to do with the video compared with the previous one. Uh, so that yeah, you can so maybe video... get, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the video is shorter and uh, there will definitely be some initial parts that are very similar to the previous one. I will just let it all flow. And then at the very end, uh, we'll make some pointers about uh, how to get the peritoneum without the, without the rectum. So should I go ahead? Go ahead. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to uh, to, to to put forward some of the questions here. I'll try to answer some of them maybe myself uh, while this is going on. 
All right, so setup always the same as we saw before. We are uh, starting on, on that uh, peritoneum as we're opening this incision. Taking a look at the disease, the lateral dissection is exactly the same as, as in the first video that we saw. Um, we're basically mobilizing the pericolic gutters on the left and right. We define the bladder as we saw before um, and uh, move down both the middle as well as the sides of the bladder. We saw that in the last video as well. Um, here you can actually see uh, the disease. Um, and I, I would say here, uh, perhaps the, the one pointer is that Sometimes you, you kind of make a little bit of a mistake and you cut your peritoneum sort of uh, more than you, you thought. You see here that the, I don't have much to hold on to. I, I don't have much, much of the free peritoneum from this pericolic sulcus because I, I cut it off. So uh, giving yourself a little bit more of a peritoneal hand, handful, even if the peritoneum there is, is normal, is helpful. Uh, but you can you can still do it and and hold it with a with a clamp or something like that. So we're moving here laterally and mobilizing the rectum. Um, this patient is a little bit more fatty and a little bit less clear uh, on the video to see the the planes. But we are uh, mobilizing the the mesorectal plane here, just as we saw in the first video. And one pointer here that it's important is that even though we will not be doing a rectal sigma resection, it is really important to do the full rectal mobilization in the same plane and all the way down, just like we did for a rectal resection. This is essential in order to do a peritoneal sparing uh, peritonectomy. And here I would like to uh, pause it just for a second because as you could see, we mobilize it all the way down externally. And then we come back up and we start cutting the peritoneum alongside the rectosigmoid. And for this, it's really important to have your hand on the rectum and stretching it up to make it straight and tense. And then you can really pass by the bobby next to its side and start going down. We will not go, to go down all, all the way to the cul-de-sac. We will go back laterally, so to speak, and um mobilize the here we are doing the left side doing the exact same thing moving along the side of the uh, rectosigmoid until we come essentially to the cul-de-sac uh, and then we will not work from the inside we will work from the outside you see that we are starting to show this fatty tissue on the outside of the peritoneum that we will slowly cut through going from one side to the other. And as we sort of thin it, we are lifting on the peritoneum and that lifts the, the cul-de-sac off of the rectum. So we're working from the sides, uh, from the outside on the front. You see this in this uh, video and the peritoneum is shown by this green cone. It's getting smaller and smaller and sort of converging on the last attachments uh, of the cul-de-sac. Um, but this uh, uh, thinning the fatty tissue from the outside really helps uh, to avoid injury. In this case, the, uh, as you can see, we're trying a new bovi, which is quite fiery. So for the very last uh, part of the uh, uh, separation of the peritoneum from the serosa of the uh, rectum, which is what we will have to do in order to transect the final part of the uh, cul-de-sac, we are switching to scissors. Um, but in, uh, um, in many cases, you can do that with, uh, with bobic electrocautery as well. So this is the final result. You see a very similar looking pelvis to the other uh, uh, case, with the exception that the rectum is here, but all of the peritoneum from the pelvis, including the very um, peritoneal reflection of the cul-de-sac has been removed. So I will stop sharing Sorry. again so we can go back to some so comments. I would like, to, uh, you know, since I didn't have the chance to say anything in, in the comments uh, for obvious reasons, just two, two quick things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, talking about technique, dissection technique, uh, you know, we have been taught, uh, you and I, uh, about using very high voltage uh, on in, in our cautery uh, and also using ball tip. Uh, 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 electrocautery. Uh, I see that you use the the blade tip uh, usually, and which I think it's it, it's good too. Can you comment on on ball tip versus regular tip and on uh, volt voltage settings for that section? Um, so I was uh, <laughs> brought up using ball tip at very high settings. 
uh, which does a beautiful dissection, um, but it has the downside of producing a lot of smoke. So you have to operate for hours with a very loud smoke evacuator in the room, which is no fun. So I have actually then switched to a regular bogey, and uh, my experience is that you can still do a pretty good job. So I now use a regular bogey. I think there is some uh, difference in quality of bogey, so look for a good tip and a good generator because there is a difference. Um, and we use it at 45. Okay, a 45 uh, cut, 45 uh, coag for both? Watery, watery spray. Okay, spray, okay. I go a little higher than that. Uh, in, 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 in any case, uh, another uh, just very important point that I think is here, teaching point, which is, uh, again, we have heard it over and over to exhaustion uh, 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 back in our training days, which is uh, this great uh, exercise you showed of traction and counter traction. I think this is uh, really magic, magic in, 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 the, in doing this. As, as Vadim showed uh, and explained, you know, we're following the, the, the thin peritoneum. And yes, again, it is not as thin as uh, that you cannot uh, put traction, even strong traction on that. So so traction on the peritoneum and counter traction on the rectum, for example, or on the wall or on the bladder allows you to, to really show you the plane beautifully and then put it your cartridge. So, so I think that this is uh, one of the things that I could... Uh, uh, your stress together with this uh, concept of centripetal. Uh, this is a beautiful uh, saying, centripetal surgery, uh, again, which is embedded in our, in our heads, uh, which is just going around and around, uh, you know, until, until you find, uh, you know, uh, a good plane or, or a good place where to, where to go. We have uh, some other uh, questions here uh, from the audience. Uh, 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 for example, Badim, you, you were talking about the, uh, uh, about the uh, uh, diversion, not diversion. Uh, some people here asking about possibility of use of transanal drainage uh, 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 instead of uh, anastoma. What do you think? If you have a colorectal anastomosis that you're worried about, uh, whether you would uh, consider using transanal drainage instead of anastoma. Right. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, uh, low anterior uh, pelvic anastomosis is uh, three times safer than any other anastomosis in in the using this technique. And if you're worried about uh, anastomosis, you should not be doing it, uh, uh, I think. And uh, transanal drainage, I never used it, to be honest with you. I think it's uh, uh, uncomfortable for the patient. And uh, um, I I haven't seen any data for that, so and we just didn't use it. Didn't Certainly, it. out there in the in the rectal cancer literature, but, yeah, but it's, it's true it's, that it's not it's, it's not uh, maybe in in, in the peritoneal work is right. not that. Uh, something that we usually do, but but again, it's it's certainly a, a pertinent question to 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 ask. Uh, and maybe uh, Tan, uh, maybe uh, you can answer this question. Uh, I hope that it, uh, it, it you don't uh, you don't feel like like I'm trying to cut you uh, offhanded. But uh, this question: Would you consider doing this procedure laparoscopically, and what would be your limitations? Yeah, I think that it's a little harder to really get the tension going laparoscopically. Um, I personally would prefer to do it robotically just because in terms of assistance. Um, but I think that it, it it would be doable in in, in the right uh, hands. Well, you know that there's actually a lot of literature uh, going on, actually, even a registry uh, of laparoscopic peritonectomy uh, uh, by Soji, and, and also uh, we at ESO have a, a laparoscopic uh, course, uh, ESO course on laparoscopic cetrodex surgery and HIPEC. Certainly it can be done. Uh, you know, uh, certainly I'm not the one to do it, uh, I, I have to say, but, uh, but I have to say that there are very skilled people out there. Just uh, keep in mind that, uh, that the indications for that are very, very, very uh, strict and very, very, very uh, narrow. Uh, to start with, but uh, just to, to clarify uh, over here. Uh, the other thing uh, here, uh, Vadim, uh, we're talking about visceral sparing uh, peritonectomy in the pelvis. Uh, of course, we can do sometimes what we call a Douglasectomy, uh, just take out the Douglas pouch uh, if uh, that can be done. Uh, would you consider uh, doing a rectum serosa stripping in cases of isolated lesions on the anterior wall of the of the rectum. 
Yes, I, I actually did did it yesterday. I uh, oh, uh, look at that! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do do this uh, stripping and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, every, a, everything that uh, preserves the organs is is good and peritoneal surface malignancy. It doesn't pay. For example, in the, in the United States, you are paid for organ resections, unfortunately, but uh, definitely um, uh, for the patient's sake, uh, I, we do it quite frequently. Excellent. And, uh, and then, uh, Lana, uh, after this uh, beautiful colorectal anastomosis, which we know that in your program, your, uh, your fistula rate is close to 0% uh, historically, uh, what, what is the, uh, the test, if any, you do to, to, uh, um, you know, to assess that anastomosis? Any bubble test, uh, uh, anything like that? This is another question from the audience. Yeah, uh, so uh, I mean, the first first thing that we always do is just make sure that we that we are uh, doing attention free anastomosis that our uh, descending colon where anastomosing is well mobilized and well perfused. That's uh, number one. We don't do it in the CN, CNN green to check perfusion. We just do it by eyes. And then once the anastomosis is done and reinforced with stitches, uh, here we do a methylene blue test with liquid. Uh, I used to do an air test uh, when I was in the United States. I think both work uh, can be done. Um, and it's extremely unusual for us to have a leak in the operating room. If we do, uh, we would uh, reinforce it, redo the test, and almost always divert. But this is really, really, really unusual to see a positive leak test in the operating room. Uh, and as far as, as uh, leak rates la later on, I totally agree with Vadim. I think uh, in our experience, the colorectal anastomosis is not the most risky one in uh, cytoreductive surgery, um, but it's the ileocolic, uh, which is kind of counterintuitive, I guess, but uh, we really do not have a problem with the colorectal anastomosis. So we feel very comfortable doing the anastomosis in this way and not diverting routinely. Excellent. Uh, uh, again, just uh, because there's, there's a question here, uh, uh, let, let's talk again about this anastomosis. Vadim Tan, uh, do you consider uh, this reinforcing of, of, of the suture line uh, uh, with, uh, with regular silk sutures or something? Dr. Shoemaker uh, used to say, uh, if I can put a suture around the, the anastomosis, then I do not divert. I only divert when I cannot put my uh, another layer of sutures around. Uh, uh, is is that uh, part of your of your practice? Uh, or what, what what is your practice? Um, I, I really like the idea of doing the dog ears. I think that's great. Um, in ovarian cancer, we um, also have issues with high output ileostomies in terms of chemotherapy that we give afterwards. So we try to avoid an ileostomy if we can. So I think that that's great to um, try to avoid that. Any, any reinforcement of the suture line, Tan, um, uh, in your case? Yes, no, we, we try to do that. I really like the idea of the of that dog ear. Um, so I, I think that most of our surgical oncologists try to do that as well. You mean uh, putting a suture uh, around the, the staple line? That's what I mean. I mean, uh, doing lumbar sutures uh, to reinforce the suture, the, the staple line. Yeah, just laterally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. How about you, Vadim? Yeah, we, yeah we, we do that too. I think it serves two, uh, two purposes. One is you're absolutely sure you need to see what you're putting the stitches in. So you're, you're visually confirming the intact anastomosis by, by just virtue of doing that. And second, you probably um, uh, you probably take some tension off. Otherwise, I'm not very uh, kind of for a second layer usually, but this is my uh, uh, exception. So we usually put um, a layer of uh, uh, interrupted sutures around the anastomosis. Anastomosis. Okay, there's another question here, uh, which uh, I think it's uh, interesting, uh, Lana. Do you consider or would you consider a cystopexy in these patients because the, the bladder it becomes too uh, floppy or too blobby? No, no, we never, we have, I've never done it. Um, and I wouldn't even know where to fix it because everything's kind of gone around it. Uh, and I've never, but I have to say, I've never had a patient with an issue. 
sometimes you do have a CT scan postoperatively where the bladder looks really funny and, you know, it has sort of a funny shape because it has scarred to one side or another. But clinically, I don't think it has any relevance for the patient. So, no, we don't do anything with the bladder. Okay. Well, you know what? Uh, we arrived uh, maybe to to uh, one whole hour of of of, of webinar, and and I think that uh, that we really had a a, a great a uh, great great uh, we were able to put together very good videos. Uh, so so thank you very much, Lana, and 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 uh, can't remember your your research fellow's name, but but he did a great job uh, <laughs> uh, with that. Uh, you know, uh, and we know that is not easy. So great videos, uh, great uh, colleague moderators, and 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 discussions here. Great uh, Vadim, great Tan, to meet you. Uh, uh, and and I think that uh, that you all from the audience uh, put uh, forward a very interesting. Uh, uh, discussion questions because there are basically questions that uh, that from us as experts uh, are uh, let's say kind of like uh, uh, everyday life questions but uh, we know that uh, from the teaching point of view they are very pertinent and and they need to be asked uh, and I think that uh, that that uh, led to a very meaningful uh, discussion. I don't think we have time for anything else. Uh, Lana. Uh, do you want to uh, to say some uh, some closing remarks or some uh, uh, closing words? Just thank you all for for your uh, participation. Great discussion. Uh, thanks again for ESO for their administrative support. Uh, and I hope we get some feedback from the participants, whether they like this idea of addressing some technical issues in the webinar, and hopefully the, the technical issues with the video flow can be improved for the next edition of this uh, webinar series. Thank you so much, everyone. For sure. Thank you very much. See you next time.